Uh, good, good evening, Shofar family. Uh, it's so good to be back here. I was here uh, sometime at the end of, end of last year, and uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing to be back here. I'm, I'm uh, coming from Johannesburg, and uh, it's incredible to see the sun so bright and uh, still in its full force, you know, at this time of, of day. You guys have it really good. Uh, you must know that. Um, all right, I... Uh, We've got lots to say. I'm going to jump right into it, if that's okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to pray. Uh, Lord, uh, I'm just reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul saying, my preaching wasn't with wise and persuasive words, but a demonstration of the Spirit and power. Uh, Lord, we pray uh, for just a leaning on the Spirit and the Spirit's power. Um, yeah, thank you that your word is powerful. And your, your spirit works in and through us. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, all right, fam. I uh, turned 40 last year, right? And uh, yeah, yeah, I know I look like I'm a student, but uh, <laughs> it's them jeans. It's them jeans. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I, I remember a mentor of mine uh, said to me like, like, Langa, listen, there's some habits you need to get in place before you turn 40. Otherwise, by the time you get to 40, you're going to struggle to kind of, you know, get those things in place and to maintain those things. And, uh, and so one of the things then I decided, I was like, you know, I'm going to make sure that I, I, I get into gym and I get in, in, uh, in, in shape and things like that. And, uh, and it's something that I, I did in my younger days and I kind of struggled in my older days and kind of, you know, made excuses why I couldn't go to the gym. And the thing is also, when you say you go to the gym, immediately, like, people look you up, and they're like, results, we want to see. <laughs> but anyway, so, so just before, so when I, when I, when I was 39, uh, I was living in a particular neighborhood, and then there was a, a, a CrossFit gym, uh, like, around the corner from me. And uh, anyone go to CrossFit or anything in the gym, you know, those... You know, how do you know someone goes to CrossFit? Exactly there. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm telling you now. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, so, so here's the thing with me. And why is, what is, the, is the big thing is that I, so you can see by my physique, I like kind of just grow one way. I'm just, you know, like I'm a wicket. I look like a wicket. That's. And so my fear is like, if I gain weight, I won't gain weight in the rest of my body. It will just be on my bop. And there's nothing worse than being as skinny as I am and then just having this, you know. So I'm like, that is not happening to me. I refuse in Jesus' name. <laughs> right? And, uh, and so I started to go to the, the gym and it did, what, you know, it, it was good also for my mind as well. And, uh, and just getting it in, in, in good shape and all that stuff. And then, and then so we happened to move neighborhood and we moved out to uh, an area kind of on the outskirts of Johannesburg. It's called Milders Drift. It's just, uh, if anyone knows Johannesburg, just past Krugersdorp. And, uh, and so there was like no CrossFit gym around there. And uh, so I said, okay, I'm going to try to keep it up. I'm going to buy some equipment and, uh, and gym at home. Has anyone ever tried that? And the equipment just kind of chills there, right? <laughs> All right? And I realized that there's just something I need to be in a space where there are people exercising uh, for me to actually be able to get in shape. And so, so I struggled a bit. Uh, uh, and then I, I found that there was a, a, a virgin active around the corner from us. And I was like, shucks, man. Uh, I hope it's not, like, too expensive. I don't know if I can... Uh, you know, pay whatever fee that I need to, you know, for the Virgin Active. And then so I, I went to the Virgin, I decided, you know what, I'm going to get off and go. And I'm going to make a plan and get back to gym. And so I went to Virgin Active and I was praying, Lord God, I need a miracle. Make it happen. I need to get in shape. You know, all these weird Christian prayers that we pray. But anyway, and so I arrived there. And so this is now in December. I arrived there in December and I signed up. Uh, I, I go to the guys, to the agents, and I try to sign up for a membership. And the guy's like, yes, please sign up. Actually, do you know what, bro? We've got a special going on right now. Uh, you can get, you can pay the lowest amount for your membership and get the, the most access to uh, the highest access, uh, which is the, the premium or the premier 
uh, access, which means you can gym at any gym, right? And, uh, and I'm like, are you, f-? you know, I was like, thank you, Jesus. You know, I have access to all the gyms in the country. You know, the Lord has answered my prayer. And I'm like, why is this, why, what's this going, what's going on? I was like, listen, bro, it's December. Ain't nobody trying to sign up for gym. <laughs> and so it's a way to incentivize people to get into gym, to, to sign up and, and get gym memberships. And, and so I'm like, why? He's like, yeah, bro, it's December. <laughs> it's December, bro. You know, December is all about eating and groove, as we say in Joburg, which means good times, which means just vibes. December is just, just vibes, just vibes. That's what it's about. No one's trying to get fit. No one's trying to get, however he said, but come January, come January, the gym will be packed. And that's when they hike up their membership uh, fees. Now you know, right? And, uh, and so when I looked at this, I was like, yeah, actually, it's a real thing. It's uh, December. We call it festive season, right? Why? Because we feast and we groove. We have good times in December. It's that time where we gather around as families, as friends, as brides, as brides, as brides, and more brides, right? And it's all about eating. It's all about feasting. And uh, so when you actually think about it, it's, Feasting is, is central to who we are as human beings. In actual fact, anthropologists would say pretty much every culture celebrates momentous occasions through feasting. If there's a birthday, you feast. If there's a Christmas, you feast. If there's Easter, whatever it is, you feast. Something awesome happens, you feast. And, that's, and this is how we as human beings uh, celebrate life. And, uh, and so it's no wonder why feasting is also central to Scripture. So, biblically, this is something that you find, uh, if you read through the Old Testament, it was something that God uh, actually commanded Israel to do, was to feast. They had uh, seven different appointed times, uh, six of which involved feasting, like you had to eat. Like God instructed you to eat. And feast. Can you imagine that? And guys say, God is boring. Guys, God is not boring. All right? Six of them, you had to feast. Uh, in one, actually, if you find in Deuteronomy 14, 14, 26, you can look it up if you don't believe me. There's a commandment to take your tithe. So back then, it was an agricultural society, and so it would be crops, uh, it would be, you, you know, vegetables or whatever it may be. Maybe uh, 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 you had sheep. Uh, so a tenth of your sheep, you'd have to take that either, either uh, then you'd either, if you were going to, the, you'd have to go to the temple and then uh, convert it into money. And then thereafter, God actually gives them the instruction, take some of that money and buy yourself something nice. Like it's in the Bible. God says, buy yourself something nice, eat, feast, enjoy yourself, have a good time, groove, sponsored by God himself. <laughs> Guys, you, you guys are not hearing, the Lord is serious, guys, about, about a Holy Ghost party. <laughs> and uh, so God gives them that instructions, and he says, enjoy yourself. You know, enjoy yourself. Get whatever your heart desires. And then he says, also then invite the Levites or those serving in the temple. Uh, invite the poor, invite the widow also, so that they can also rejoice and enjoy with you these good things. But what was central to that was eating and feasting. This is the Lord, right? I, thought, I, I think sometimes all we talk about is fasting. <laughs> God is serious about feasting, guys. He even commands it, as I said. And then we, we step into the, the, the New Testament. Jesus steps into the scene. And John 2, the first miracle Jesus performs is where? At a wedding, at a wedding, the, the prophet uh, D.L. Hewley, I'm joking, he's a comedian, he's not a prophet, please, <laughs> he makes a joke, he says like, you know, Jesus, you can imagine Jesus stepping onto the, stepping onto the scene there, and D.L. Hewley is like saying, look, he was convinced uh, uh, Jesus was black because of that particular miracle, he says, you know what, Jesus stepped into the scene, people come up to Jesus, oh, Jesus, Jesus, we've run out of wine. What can we do? 
Jesus is like, uh, I don't normally do this, but keep the party going. <laughs> and he turns water to wine to keep the party going. Right? And so feasting is central to who we are as human beings and central to, to God's heart is for us to gather around a table, celebrate, and eat. And so that's what I want to share a, a little about this evening is communion. Most of us know it as, as communion. And uh, so you guys have heard the word before, communion? Familiar with that, right? Awesome. I'm going to sit down. So we're going to look at two scriptures tonight, uh, beginning with Luke 22. Where's one of the places where Jesus actually institutes uh, this practice, although it was already a common practice within that culture, uh, but Jesus kind of breaks it open for us. So I'm going to read from Luke 22, 14 to 19. And so what's happened here is... Uh, Jesus is, is about to celebrate one of these feasts called the Passover, one of the, the six feasts, uh, sorry, the seven feasts uh, uh, that, that, uh, that, that Israel were, were commanded to celebrate. And so one of them was the Passover. And so he's about to, to share about the Passover. He's about to reveal to his disciples also that he is that Passover lamb, that the Passover is actually about him. Verse 14, and when the hour came, he reclined. At the table. And back in those days, they wouldn't sit in chairs like, like we do today. They would actually have low tables and they would sit on, on cushions and they would recline. Recline. And that was a sign of relaxing. Today the word came about just relaxing in God's presence. That's the posture that we're supposed to have. Is we're supposed to just chill and be comfortable in the presence of the Lord. Are you with me? He reclined at the table and the, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, so he's sitting with his disciples. And he says to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He was about to go to the cross to suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took a cup, which would have been a cup of wine. And when he had given thanks... He would have raised the cup of wine and uh, said a prayer. Uh, he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it amongst yourself. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So he passed around the cup of wine. And he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given to you. For this is, uh, for this in remembrance of me. So he tells them and he gives them this Passover meal, gives them these elements that were already there on their table. And he now says, hey, listen, this is my blood and this is my body. And he says, take it and do it in remembrance of me. Now, often when we read the scripture, we think we just look at the elements as in the, the bread and the cup, as in that is what we're supposed to do in remembrance of Jesus. But in actual fact, what he's saying is do everything in remembrance of him. So remember, they're actually having a meal. They're having dinner. They're having a Passover feast. It's Jesus at the center. Jesus who's the host. And he's sitting with his disciples. Those that are following him, his apprentices. And he's saying, do this whole thing in remembrance of me. Do you get that? The whole meal, the whole idea, it's about remembering him. Not just the bread and the cup, but the whole meal itself. And the way that Jesus did it was supposed to be in remembrance of him. And so then we see his disciples or his apprentices. Then in uh, Acts 2 doing the same thing. If you go to Acts 2.42. 
So now his disciples are following in his example and doing what he uh, instructed them to do, doing this in remembrance of him. And so they also then begin to journey with other people and, uh, and teach others what Jesus had taught them. And this is what we find in Acts uh, 42, uh, 242 all the way to 47. And they devoted themselves. So this is the, the early church. Uh, the first kind of disciples of the disciples as the gospel was preached. And now all of a sudden this church had, uh, had gathered in this place. And so this is what they did in those, in those days. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to breaking of bread and prayers. So again, it says they devoted themselves. To devote yourself is to give yourself to that thing, right? If you're devoted to someone, you, your thoughts are around that person. They're always top of mind. Uh, your energy, your resources are towards that thing. Are you with me? It's a real active thing, devotion to, to, to something or to someone. Uh, you could be devoted to a sport or you're an athlete and you are exercising your training so that you could be the best at that thing, Right? It takes effort, it takes work, it takes energy. So this is what the church devoted themselves to, gave themselves to. So firstly, the apostles' teaching, which was the Word of God. And today we spoke about that, having a high value of God's Word. Uh, the second thing was the fellowship. Uh, third thing was the breaking of bread. And then the fourth thing was prayers. I love that uh, when, when they... You guys put up the announcement for intercession on Mondays. There was a woo, an excitement to actually pray together. Because that's core, that's central for us as church, as God's people, is praying together. And then it says, uh, and awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. People were together and they had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. It's a bit crazy. All right? Uh, you need to also understand that these were necessarily people that came from the same neighborhood, same backgrounds. You had slaves, you had slave owners, you had Jews, you had Greeks, you had a mixed bag of people. But these people came together in one place because of the gospel, because of what Jesus did in and through their lives, and this began to happen. They began to fellowship with each other, and the expression of this fellowship came in these things, people selling things and, and giving and serving one another with their possessions and their things, right? And then it says, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They receive their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so what they had was that they had, as it says, they gathered in the temple. So they had the big gathering with maybe hundreds of people. Uh, it's believed that there were about 5,000 people that were part of that first church. And so they would gather like this in a big gathering, but then they would go in homes. And what would they do? They would eat. They would feast. They would fellowship. And you'd see that over and over again. So just see how many times food comes up in that uh, paragraph. Breaking bread in their homes. They received their food. They spoke about food, eating, bread, eating, 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 gathering together to eat together, and all in remembrance of who? Jesus. So, I want to go through the, the different, there's about the five different Words that are used for communion in, that we find in the, in the New Testament. And they all speak about the same thing, the same idea about us gathering around the table and eating and feasting together. So the first one is 
the actual word communion, which is probably the most commonly known word for what we practice, I guess, in our churches with the bread and the wine. Uh, but communion comes from a Greek word, koinonia. Uh, what word do you think also stems from communion? Com, community. Community, that's the root word. That's where it comes from. It's the idea of being together with Jesus and being together with each other. That we commune with Jesus, but we also commune with each other. And that's where, that's where the idea comes from. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, Paul writes, Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share in one loaf. What's the common word that keeps popping up there? One. One. Because we're called to be one. When we gather as a community, we are one. We are one in Christ, and we become one with each other as well, as we interact and as we fellowship with each other. So this is what communion, communion is about, is about community. Communing with Jesus as a community. It's not just about, hey, me and Jesus. It's me and Jesus, but also me and Jesus and Jesus' people. And you know what? You don't get to choose who Jesus' people are. Communion. We'll, we'll go deeper there. The second thing is the other word that comes up or phrase, speaking about the same thing, is the phrase of breaking of bread. Breaking of bread. And so we read in Acts 2 that it was uh, one of the things that they did. They, they uh, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, to fellowship, and breaking of bread. Exactly the same uh, thing that it's referring to. And again, it's the same meal. And again, you need to understand that in, the, in that time, in the, in the ancient Near East, mid, the, the near middle, uh, ancient Near Middle East, is that things like wine and bread were central, were like staple Staple. So every household at a meal, you would have these things. Uh, and so these were central to, to uh, so Jesus used the things that were found in everyday homes uh, to, to demonstrate his desire for, for, for his community, for how they would worship him and, and love each other. And uh, so breaking of bread is one of them. And so one of the significant things around breaking of bread is that they would have a loaf very similar to, to what we have here today. They didn't have that uh, Albany uh, loaf <laughs> sliced, you know, ready for your, for your sami or whatnot. It would be a loaf like this. And, uh, and in those days, they didn't, uh, they didn't really have knives. So they wouldn't just come, someone would pull out a nice serrated knife and just, you know, what would happen is that they would break the bread. Jace, can you come in, bro? And so... This is what you do, even to Paul's reference about one loaf, is that you would, there we go. Right? And so that's why it's called breaking of bread. You would break this loaf, and then you would pass it on to the next person. They would also break a chunk, and then pass it on, and they would also break a chunk. And it's, so it's this expression of you break the bread. And uh, the simple idea around breaking of bread is that it's to remind us that life comes through sacrifice. Is that everything that we take, everything that we receive to give us life has to die first before we, it, it gives us life. Right? Do you think of well, the ingredients for, for this thing? You know, some seed had to die. Something had to die. The, the meat that we eat, something had to die to give us nourishment, to give us life. But above all, it represents the body of Jesus that was ripped and torn apart for us, for our healing. And so when we gather together and we break the bread, it reminds us of what Jesus did for us on the cross. In Isaiah uh, 
uh, 40, uh, 53, it says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was uh, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement uh, that brought us peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. It's that Jesus was torn. Jesus was beaten. Jesus was chastised so that we could have healing and peace. Are you with me? And so when we break that bread, it, it reminds us as a people that, hey, I have life because someone gave up their life for me. The third one is Eucharist. In some uh, church traditions, you'd hear it, know it as uh, the, the, the Eucharist. Eucharist, it comes from the Greek word Eucharisto, which means to give thanks. And so just as in Luke 22, it says that, and he... Uh, took the cup or he broke the bread and he gave thanks. As in he said, he gave thanks for what, for what he had. As in, uh, um, and so that's where we get the idea of the Eucharist. It's a, it's a meal also where we, where we give thanks. Where we give thanks for what we have. We give thanks for all the Lord has done for us. We give thanks for what God is doing in our community. And we give thanks for the hope of what God has promised to do in our community, and in our lives, and in and through us. And so this is also where we get the idea of uh, things like grace. Uh, how many of you sit down and you say like a prayer or grace at the, you know, be, before a meal? You know, for, the, for what we're about to receive. May the Lord make us truly thankful or grateful. Amen, right? You've heard that before? For those of you that come from like boarding school or... <laughs> You know, it's, 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 it's those kind of things. And that's where we get the idea of grace, of saying grace as well. It's that giving, giving thanks. It's, uh, you know, we teach our children as well. That's, it's, uh, uh, we picked it up from another family, and I'm sure they picked it up from another family. I want to, thank you, Father, thank you, Father, for our food, for our food. Oh, Amen. Come on. <laughs> there we go, right? And it comes again from that, the, the Eucharist, where we give thanks. We give thanks. Actually, it's, it's uh, you know, even central to the, to the Jewish culture is that every, before every meal, before you eat bread, before you drink wine or you drink juice or whatever it is, you give thanks. You say, uh, uh, Blessed are you, Yahweh, or Adonai, King of the universe, who gives, us, uh, who gives us grain for bread, or who gives us the fruit of the vine. You give thanks to the Lord uh, for, for what you have and for what, he has, uh, for, for what He has given you. And so even this, sometimes you see it in homes. We also not have it in our home where we, you know, around the dinner table, we say to the kids, hey, what do you want to give thanks to? What, what, you know, what's something that's awesome that happened today? And uh, we go around the table, hey... I'm grateful that my friend came to play today. You know, I'm grateful, you know, kids say, they, but it's just that culture again of giving thanks around the table as a family. And that's where the Eucharist comes in. And then the fourth one, uh, which is found in, the, it's only, actually only found in the, in the book of Jude. It's called a love feast or the agape feast. Agape means love in Greek. And it's called the Agape Feast or the Love Feast. Uh, and in Jude, he refers to it as, uh, it's more kind of in the negative sense because there are people that are actually interrupting their love feasts. There are people that are coming with dodgy doctrines and whatnot and bringing division in this celebration, right? And also, it's called a love feast. It's a feast, as in there is food and good times. Are you, are you with me? It's important that we get that. It isn't just a, a shot of a grape juice and a wafer. It's a feast. Like we chow. We are there to chow. That, that's, that's what this is referring to. All the same thing. People gathering around the table to celebrate... And to feast. It's called a love feast because you're celebrating the love of God. And we're celebrating our love for each other as God's people. 
right? Throughout Scripture, it's a consistent theme of love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength. Right? The vertical expression, but also the horizontal expression. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so we gather together as brothers and sisters to feast together and express this love that we've received from the Father and express it within our community. And it's a love feast. And, and tell you what, guys, I know, uh, you know, when people think of feasting, they think, uh, you know, like a lamb on a spit or whatever it is. No, no, no. Guys, this, is, this was just a community of people that got together and feasted with whatever it is that they had. And so don't think now you need to go grocery shopping and come back with bags and stuff to actually have a love feast. No, it's whatever you have. You're coming, you're bringing it to the community and, and uh, celebrating, bringing your best to the community so that everyone can feast and enjoy together, right? I know there's some students in the house. Listen, students. I know you're on a budget, but don't be cheapskates also. All right? Listen, I, on a budget, I could do wonders with two-minute noodles, guys. <laughs> I'm telling you. Like, you, go make those things up. You know, find some tuna, some whatever. Just bring life, resurrection life to those two-minute noodles, guys. And you can feast. And you can feast. But it's this idea that everyone comes and brings something, contributes something to this moment where we experience or celebrate the love of God and our love for each other as God's people. And then the final one, which is also one of the more commonly known one, is the Lord's Supper. Is the Lord's Supper. And again, it's not the Lord's snack. It's the Lord's Supper. And, uh, and, and this is central in the gospel message. Because the gospel, if you can, there's many things we could say about the gospel or articulate the gospel. But essentially, the gospel is the message that Jesus is Lord. That's really kind of what it's summed up to, is that Jesus is Lord. And, and here's the thing about the gospel is... Just to explain a, a, a bit about where the idea comes from, is uh, it's the Greek word euangelion. And so back in those days, when nations would be at war against each other, what would happen is uh, they didn't have uh, cell phones, they didn't have walkie-talkies and things like that where they would communicate and, and, give, and send comms to each other. What they would do is that they would have messengers. And so back in those days, if two nations were at war or two kings were at war against each other, uh, what would happen is that if you were on the losing side, your people would be enslaved or subjugated by the winning king or by the winning nation. Are you, are you with me? It, it was like that. Like if you lost, it was, it was over for you. Peop the, those people would come and take over your lands take over your positions, and you would probably enslave, be enslaved to them. Uh, and, and, and also the other way around. So what would happen is that people would go out, let's say the men would go out to war and battle each other. And then you would have messengers, and then everyone else would stay at home. And then you would have messengers that would run back and tell you what's up, how the war is going how the battle is going. And so those people were called messengers. And so what they, were, and they, what they would get, they would get the people that would run the fastest. And that's why it says uh, in Scripture, you have this theme of how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. It's not that their feet are pedicured and, and nice and pretty, but it's because they run. Right? And, and so if you are on the winning side... People would run, these messengers would run. Can you imagine everyone is waiting with like bated breath? Like, what's the news? What's the news? How's it going? Because like your life depends on it, right? Your future depends on the outcome of that war or that battle. Are you with me? And so people would wait 
in their cities, it would bated breath of just like, and then you'd see uh, Jason coming from a distance. Coming, coming. And everyone's now like, yo, guys, Jason is coming. Does he look happy? Is he sad? Is he excited? Is he fearful? Right? And you're watching and you're waiting with bated breath to see and to hear what Jason will bring, what news Jason will bring. And hopefully he would bring good news. That good news would be, hey, guys, our king is winning. We are on the winning side. And that is euangelion. That is the good. That's why it's called the good news. Good news. So Jason would bring that news that, hey, guys, we're winning. We're winning. We're okay. It's good times for us and our people. And so, so that's the gospel, is now people coming back, people proclaiming this good news, saying that Jesus is Lord. Actually, Jesus is King. Jesus has won. Jesus is Lord over all. That is our King, Jesus. That is our King, Yeshua. That is our King, Jesu. That is our King, Jesus. That is our King, Jesu. Whatever it is that he, 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 he is reigning and he is Lord, as in he is boss, as in he is victorious. And so people run to declare this news, this good news, this good news of salvation, that, hey, we have been delivered from our enemy. Salvation also comes from the word salve in, in, uh, in Latin, which means to heal. Not only to deliver, but to heal. So Jesus comes with this gospel to say, hey, guys, you're okay. There is an invitation for the forgiveness of sins. Hey, guys, there's an invitation for healing. Healing from the inside out. Healing from the disease of sin. Healing from your greed. Healing from your envy. Healing from your selfishness. Healing from your bigotry, your racism, whatever you may be. There is offer of this through this gospel. There's healing. Not only from the inside, but from the outside as well. That he's here to heal you, to make you whole. He's known as the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Shalom. Shalom meaning nothing missing, nothing broken. You are whole. So no matter how long you've been struggling with something or wrestling with something or what brokenness you come from or brokenness you're experiencing, there's an invitation through the gospel to be saved and to be made whole. Through this proclamation, there's freedom from guilt. There's freedom from condemnation. The word went out tonight. There is no longer condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. No matter what you've done, no matter how bad, whether you stole a cup of sugar or you murdered someone, there's freedom from guilt. There's freedom from shame, that's the invitation that the gospel brings. There's provision for your need. Whatever you need in order to be who God has called you to be, to flourish as a human being, there's provision in this gospel. But how does that provision come? And this is also what the gospel does, is that it brings us into family. It brings us into family. It creates a new family where God is our father. And we are all brothers and sisters. 
Psalm, Psalm 68 says that he, he sets the solitary in family. He's the defender of the widow and the father of the fatherless. There's God in his holy habitation. God creates a family. God takes those that are lonely, takes those that are far off, and he brings them near, and he puts them in family because that's his heart. That's the heart of the father. It's to make us family, put us into family. There should not be a single lonely person in this place because we're called to be family. Do you know that the word Christian only shows up, I think, three times in the New Testament? Three times in the New Testament. However, the word disciple or apprentice of Jesus, disciple or apprentice of Jesus shows up over 250 times in Scripture. And then the word brethren or brothers and sisters shows up over 350 times. That's where the emphasis lies, is that we're called to be family. We're called to be family. We're called to be brothers and sisters, to see each other as brothers and sisters, regardless of where we come from. But at this table, we are brothers and sisters. God is our Father. God is our Abba. We all come in, we all come to this table through the same way, through the blood and the, the spilled bloody of, blood of Jesus and the broken body of Jesus. Are you with me? That's what makes us brothers and sisters. You know, when we talk about church today, if uh, uh, you think of if I say to you, hey, show me a picture of your church. More often than not, this is kind of what will show up. Can you show the picture, the welcome? This is in, in today's culture. Is kind of, you know, that's kind of like a church, right? It's like, yeah, this is our church. This, this, is, this is how we'd advertise church, right? And, uh, and it, there's nothing wrong with that. There's, there's nothing, I'm not saying that's wrong. Us gathered like this, other gathered pictures, like, that's, that's church. That's a community of God gathered. However, it was interesting to learn that one of the first pictures found of the early church, it was uh, halfway mid uh, the second century, the first kind of painting or picture of, of church, of the early church, uh, looks like this. It's called the Fractio Panis. It's in, uh, in Rome. I guess where all these uh, frescoes and cool things generally are. Right? And so it's interesting to see that it's a bunch of people gathered around a table. What are they doing? They are, they're eating. You can't see it clearly, but there's actually bread and fish, fish there. And they gather around the table, eating. Eating. And, and the name of the, 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 the painting is Fractio Panos, which means break, breaking the bread. And so this was central to the church, is people gathering around the table to fellowship with each other, to love God, celebrate what God is doing, and love each other around around this table. And so one of the things that, that they understood then was the idea that the Lord's Supper was that it was also in reference to a covenant meal. In those days in the ancient Near East, if you were entering into a covenant with someone, you would uh, slaughter an animal. But then after that, to seal the covenant, you would actually eat a covenant meal. You would eat with someone. And you're saying, hey, you are my brother, you are my sister. And the, and the power in covenant is that, is that you say, what is mine is yours, what's yours is mine. I am here for your benefit, you are here for my benefit. It's for mutual flourishing. That we get together to serve each other, to help each other, to encourage each other. 
And so it was understood as the Lord's Supper because they were a covenant community. They weren't just cool people in a room together. But as they gathered around this table, it would be the rich, the poor, the young, the old, the black, the white, whoever it was, gathering together on equal terms because they all came in and sat at the table because of the body and the blood that was shared. And they were there as covenant brothers, as covenant sisters, to love and to serve each other. And so I want to encourage us in this to, to, to think about community. To think about sitting around the table, eating together. Sharing a meal and ask ourselves the question, who is at my table? One of the, the, the practices that the early church would actually do is that they would have an open seat for Jesus. So that they were aware of the presence of Christ in their midst as they fellowship. And so for us as we gather, as hey, we're this community of people bound together and brought together by Jesus. How can we serve one another? How can we celebrate what God is doing? How can we come together? There's some that have been walking this journey as disciples of Jesus for years. There's some that have just got in and it's a bit awkward for them. The older people just say, hey, listen, let me show you how it's done. Let me journey with you. The older women show the younger ladies how to do life. The older men show the younger dudes how to do life. And we build family like this. Some of you guys come from households where you don't have a father or you don't have a mother. You find a father or a mother here, the worms and the tannies, the uncle, uncles and aunties here. They become your family. You get to learn the heart of God through this family and through this community. And so this is so much more than just a shot of grape juice and a wafer. But it's a lifestyle. And it's a rhythm. And again, guys, this is something that was central to the church is community. It's community. As you go this year, you're going to run into some people that are lonely. Open your table up. Set another seat at the table. Some of you are lonely in this space. You need to say, hey guys, can I get an invitation please? I'm your brother. I'm your sister. We make room. And the whole idea of church is that it's brothers and sisters coming together under Christ. We are a family. We do life together, but we also go on mission together. And when we go on mission together, all we're doing is that we are finding other brothers and sisters and just adding more chairs to the table. That's what the church is. As we experience this love and life, we say, okay, come on, bro. I can see where you're at. I can see your cord and sin. Let me share the gospel with you. Let me share this good news with you. And hey, here's a seat at the table. Come meet your other brothers and sisters. Don't worry. Don't worry how you pray. Don't worry. Ah, just come. Just come hang out with us. We'll show you how to eat. We'll show you how to celebrate. We'll show you how to party. And when we gather together, then when we have this feast, we have this celebration, we have a celebration. Why? Because we have something to celebrate. No matter where you come from, you say, yeah, we all come from darkness and now we're in light. Man, let's eat. Let's have a party. Right? We're all brothers and sisters. We all come from there. Now we're here. Man, Jesus is awesome. And we come with life, with vitality. And we celebrate Jesus. So again, this is front and center. 
to who we're called to be as the church. So I pray that this would be more for us as the community of Jesus than just a shot and a bite. But even as we take the shot and a bite, it would translate into life around a table. And that you'd ask yourself, man, who is around my table? Or who can I get around my table? And see what the Lord does uh, in our midst. Amen. All right. Can I pray for us? Cool. Oh, Jesus. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that you are our salvation. Your very name is salvation, is God who saves, is God our salvation. We thank you that you are Lord over all, that we can put our hope and our trust in you, that we have a king who is victorious over all who is victorious over all, who has given us a hope in this life, and not only just in this life, but we have the hope of glory, which is the hope of resurrection life. You have called us to be family and a father God, to be brothers and sisters. You have called us not to do church, but to be the church. So we pray, Lord, that you would turn our hearts towards you and turn our hearts towards each other in real and tangible ways. And that we would honor the instruction that you gave to your disciples who then passed it on to their disciples who passed it on to their disciples, and we are here today because of their faithfulness in keeping that message, that we would do this in remembrance of you. We would gather around the table in our homes, in our spaces, in remembrance of you, that we would share the good things that you have given us with others in remembrance of you, that we would celebrate, feast, and give thanks regularly in remembrance of you. Lord, I pray for those that are lonely in this place. Your promise is that you set the lonely in family. I pray they would have courage to accept invitations, to join family, to join community groups where they can experience life and celebration, love and healing. I pray for those that are already in community groups that they would show hospitality and open their homes, open their dorms, open their reses, open their communes to others. That they would make the circle bigger. That they would add more tables, more chairs to the table. And Lord, we know there 
right then and there, Lord, you will be present. That's your promise to us. That where we gather, two or three gather, you are there in that midst. And Lord, won't you do something that hasn't been experienced in this community? Go deeper, God. Hasn't been experienced in this region even. Whether you gather, where you're gathering people that shouldn't be gathering together in one place, eating together, feasting and celebrating. People from all walks of life with all sorts of stories, all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of ethnicities. The young, all the rich, the poor. That you would gather us all at your table. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence here.